this is my talk about 10 years of meeting C++, but it is also my talk about 10 years of meeting C++. So in case you didn't notice the difference, um, the M is small in this one and the other one is big. And I tried to do both justice in this talk. So let's get started with uh, this talk, which you know covers the last 10 years, but also tries to cover the next 10 years. But predictions are always difficult, especially if they concern the future, as we all know. Um, so I kind of want to structure this talk as past, present, and future. But that doesn't have worked out in a way that these are closed chapters to each other. So I prefer to handle the questions at the end. Also, I will be in the Discord for you available after the talk. Um, so 10 years ago, the bus was a new standard. Finally, we had a new standard. It took a long time. And honestly, back then, some people wondered what it would be like to have a new standard. And I kind of find it amusing that when you look at CPP reference at the C11 section, uh, it still seems to be incomplete. Okay, that's, that's what the um, section says there. I don't know if it's like an error, but it's still incomplete. Also, from the perspective of 10 years ago, um, this updates every three year regularly was not a thing. That was something new, that was a wild plan. And it's, I think, a good and great success for, for us in the C community that this has worked out. But I had an opinion on the standard, which I found again from 10 years or probably like 11 years. Um, this is from a C++ course I once written for mostly three, uh, C++ or three. So um, I know that's German. You probably can't read that. That's fine. Um, the first paragraph is like, how did we get here? You know, how is the standard made? The second paragraph is like, it's new, but C++ 03 doesn't change because of it. And you can actually, you know, just update and it will be great if you can do that. Um, and I, I may add a chapter about C11 to this course later. Um, and the third paragraph, I'm, I'm a bit more honest with my opinion. I'm like, yeah, it's it's nice, but we have to wait to have that actually available because the implementers are not there where a new standard is available to everyone, right? And in practice, I was a freelancer back then, and I was coming from that, and I knew that a lot of my clients would not like want to upgrade immediately to the new standard. So I kind of was like, it's nice to see, but in in, in the practice, it, it will become relevant in a few years. And also um, back then kind of seeing this as a standard of this decade, uh, thinking like C++ 11 is nice and in the twenties we get a new standard, great. Uh, that's, that's a new thing. And C++ is fairly stable. Um, this, by the way, is an English translation, um, which I have in here for purposes, if you want to read that uh, in the video, I'll continue. Because so much happened 10 years ago. You know, I, I went to C++ now, and as you see, this is a, actually a real picture from 10, 2012. Uh, as we go from the auditorium to the conference venue and kind of the, the small herd of programmers which attends this conference, is traversing the field to, to go to the uh, area where you spent the main day. You spent the morning in the auditorium and then you head over. And it was a fantastic week and I felt really welcome there. Um, there was lots of C++ knowledge, but I kind of was like, hmm, it's really nice here, but how do we teach this to the rest of the world, right? This, uh, it's nice that we have a new standard and even if we like, you know, get around this plan to have a, a, another standard in this decade, or maybe even two, um, we probably should figure out a bit more about how to reach our community, right? And also during this conference, I talked a lot about my plans to start a lot, run a conference. Um, it, it wasn't planned to be a yearly conference from the start. Uh, in the beginning, I saw it as a one-off to you know, have something from a bucket list. And on the other hand, I saw that a lot of support I surprisingly got in Aspen and North America from Europeans, which were at the conference. 
uh, even uh, one of those offered me a sponsorship and kept up to it. So thank you, Carsten, for that. They've been for a few years and a sponsor. Um, and prior to that, I had started the C++ user group. And I also had worked and done community work for um, Miko with some companies which were in Miko back then. It was mostly Nokia and Intel. Um, and so during that conference, I realized that I kind of talked myself into doing um, this as a conference. And so the first conference happened. 2012 was a great, great experience. First conference I ever organized. And um, so the program was very C++ 11 and boost heavy. We had some talks from Qt. Um, the results were that, that we had a big success, but we also had a big issue when we started the conference. We needed, to, or I, I, I heard from an issue which I wanted to address at the conference and I had like no real idea how to solve this. Uh, the German ISO CPP part, the German delegation had lost its funding. And there was at that moment, no one picking up the bill for the next year. So this would be disbanded. And with that news, I opened the conference. I um, had Michael Wong as a, CA, as a keynote speaker and I had the head of the German delegation um, on stage directly before we started the keynote and we were addressing the resign. Uh, that's, that's something we have to address. That's not good news, but maybe maybe this is a chance to solve it. I mean, everyone in the German community is here. And I, I didn't notice that someone left the audience when I said that. They, they, they made a phone call. And they said, well, it's, it's just 10K and our company can easily do that. And since then, think third sponsors the German delegation, uh, which was for me back then a miracle. That's how the conference started. We saved the German delegation. Awesome. And for me at the end, also, this is kind of a proof of concept. What, what do I want to do with a conference? I wanted to do some things, of course, different. And one, of, one really important part for me was to use the conference as a motivational tool to kind of take a piece of the conference with you and carry it in your local user group or start one to, to be that uh, local community for C++ programmers. And in order to achieve that, I did a talk, my first talk I think on this topic I ever gave on founding local C++ communities um, back then in 2012. And after this talk, actually Michael Wong gave the first, I think the first public introduction to isocpp.org which also was new there. And it's also it's 10 years this year for ISO CPP, by the way. So happy birthday, ISO CPP. Um, and then the next year came and I wanted to return to C++ now because it was such a fantastic experience to just be there. It was a holiday. And also I will now get the habit to, to go to C++ now and then visit my brother. So it's kind of a good deal for me to go there. Um, but I knew that I only could return if I give a talk. And I wanted to do the same thing at C++ now to give a talk about community management and how to start a user group. And I knew this would be impossible. It would be next near to impossible, except I would uh, try to, to um, have someone else join the presentation. And I also kind of felt like a 90 minute talk on uh, community team work was something which I probably could pull off today, but I would still prefer someone to join. And so I um, entered in my talk description when I submitted the talk. There's like a box for the program committee. I entered a, a description which very carefully described the person I would like to give the talk with, this was, which was John Cott, because I knew he also has a user group. He runs that conference and he cares about that topic. And if, if this would kind of, you know, happen, uh, that, that would be the way. And it happened. And it was a fantastic evening. Um, we both had two different presentations, so um, spoke on, on various topics regarding that was, was, a, was a great evening. And after that, we had like actually get together in the bar. And I think that due to that presentation and due to those, a lot of folks coming together and seeing that a conference from scratch is feasible, um, 
one of the first routes which led to CPPCon started there on this night that you know they they saw that they wanted to have a conference in North America which has a bigger reach than C++ now could have and might also be not as boost heavy and more open to the community and this is kind of how uh, CPPCon started to to go into a planning phase and one year later actually it would become a real thing and it was by the way awesome to be there um, on my side, I evolved meaning C++ in a platform. Um, I saw that I would need to do that because uh, some very smart person from KDAB to Adams told me that I need to kind of, you know, uh, sell every year tickets. It's not like the same people are coming back. Um, and so I would need to, you know, sell like all of my tickets to, to someone else. and. He was partly right with that. Um, for him, it was like impossible to grow the conference because that just like you know, if you if you need to sell your tickets every year, uh, how do you sell more tickets every year, right? But people came back, and also I kind of uh, realized um, that we would need to have building a community to build a reach to build a network which reached uh, Europe and uh, also um, across the world with like conferences like CPPCon. And so uh, one important thing that carried over in this is an update, which I do every year at my conference, which goes out to the whole audience, okay? So everyone is in that room while they're skipping that session. Um, there's nothing in parallel. And it's also kind of because I feel like, you know, the funding I, I, I get to have this as my main job since 2014 is from this conference. This is literally the room that pays me and I want as a community manager tell them what, you know, what happened in the community, what did we do and what other things were prominent and what are the plans for next year and also kind of, you know, uh, this block handle stuff that happened at the conference and does some entertainment and voting, etc. Um, and also part of this is why I have your attention to motivate you to start a user group. And this is the, on, on the left um, is a slide which shows the 2011 user groups that I knew about. I want to say uh, that there is ACCU around in that time frame, but I'm not sure if that was more like a conference or like, is it like a local user group? I wasn't sure about that. So I didn't put them on there originally and I kept it that way. Um, but usually mention them today when I have this slide. Then we see like, few years later, eight years later, we have this whole activity with user groups. Every one of those dots is a user group active in Europe. And um, I unfortunately never got around to, to do a similar map for North America, but I know that also in North America, there are some active user groups and worldwide anyways, um, there's uh, quite a fan fascinating um, story for this. Um, and so, you know, we entered into the golden age with, with 2014 CPPCon starting. And so for this time frame, which obviously ends with 2020, um, we had a stable committee, which grew. The conferences group also, but the committee also was, was growing, was getting more input, was getting more productive. Um, every, three, every three years we got a new standard, but still we cared about getting it right. So there was no concept in C17, which not everyone liked, but we got it in 20. Um, and we had in that time a lot of content, which kind of, you know, also made a lot of that what we do available to everyone else because um, the part of the community that comes to our conferences is very tiny. If you think about how many other programmers exist, if you're here at the conference, you probably has a lot of you probably have a lot of coworkers which aren't here. That's just just a given, just numbers. Um, so these six years lead to where we are at the present. It started in the time frame of 2011, 2012 as a new standard. And from, from this onward, things were moving and then in 2020, uh, things changed. But what do we know about that age? And here it becomes interesting because 
we do not know a lot about it. We do not have surveys or statistics on how people change to C++11. Was my opinion about C++11 right? Was it what most people thought about it? I don't know. Um, going about what I heard about the conferences, what most folks said is definitely not a biased thing, right? Can't be the truth, but we, we have those numbers up. The same for C14. Um, but I have a data source for this time frame, which I wanted to show. It's the first time I'm actually presenting this. This is now statistics from my RSS reader tool, which reads the RSS feeds I get for blogs, videos, etc. And the, the first graph I'm going to show you is uh, the things I posted. Um, these are the things which I posted as Media C++ on Twitter, LinkedIn, Facebook, okay? Um, this first very obvious spike is CppCon in 2015. Um, this data starts in March 2015 for some reason. I didn't thought about collecting the data earlier. Um, and also the reason why those spikes for CppCon exist is CppCon releases a lot of content. But also, this is a time frame where I release a lot of content for my own conference, uh, my own videos, um, a lot of news in front of the conference, new sponsors, telling people that I'm sold out, or student tickets, diversity tickets, all kind of things need to be in the news again. And so there's a lot of traffic for that. Um, and then there's like always when a dip when I'm at C++ now for like, May, most of May, I'm gone at C++ now and afterwards I visit uh, my family in the US. So, yeah. And there, of course, is also a data loss. Um, yeah, that's just a local database which isn't living on the web. And then uh, this picks up this with the pandemic in 2021 and May again for some reason. And I have data again, yay, um, which I can show you. And so we see kind of this is uh, how things were regarding content I thought was worth sharing in the pandemic. Um, and these in contrast are the posts which are available in my database. Most of them are not C++ related. Some of them are uh, from websites I don't directly share, but I have it in there to maybe see something which is worthy. Um, and if I combine those graphs, that's what we get. So you see there's a, a downtime for some time and there's always, um, you, you can see that we had a certain level of content coming through and then the, with the pandemic, this has gone down and we have not really like recovered to, to those prior levels, even this is a regular content. Um, and I, I do also see that a lot of the blocks I added to my feed reader are not active anymore. That's actually one, one of my problems to, to uh, find a good mechanism to find out if a website is not online, if, if something is you know, changed, I don't want to delete it. And this is something I'm, I'm struggling with. Um, these are over this time frame the top sources, the top 16 sources. Um, here with the numbers, uh, the cute block just has the most news, which are worth sharing. So I share this a lot. Um, on the other, Spectrum, the 16th position is KDAB. Um, so I kind of made this like all blocks I shared more than 100 posts from, and KDAB is at 102. So they have their block, which also is cute heavy, but also has more than C posts. Anamert did block for a long time and now has every now and then a post. Uh, then there's some YouTube channels like uh, shout out to Jason Turner, you know, and C now, C uh, CPCon. Um, my own content, of course, exists in this too because it's a data set which I share uh, or about the things I share. Um, Fluent C++, um, I want to give a shout out to Modern C++, which is the most active blog actually from Rainer uh, Grimm, single person blogging every week about things. Thank you for that. Uh, really, really important, I think, in our community. Um, CpppCast, of course, huge shout out to CpppCast. So sad that it ended. I think we still need a replacement for CppCast. Uh, I think we do not really have a guest focused 
C++ podcast, which puts like every week a guest on for their thing. Um, we have some people that try this, but there is not yet, I think, someone which I should you know, do this in, in full time. Um, and then, of course, I want to give a shout out to uh, the old new thing. Um, lots about parallelism, uh, Windows, and content which you otherwise do not find otherwise otherwhere. Um, really interesting book, and I guess you know it if you work on Windows. Um, of course, there are surveys, but this has started in 2018, 2017. With the annual surveys, I know that CppCon always has run some surveys, but um, not sure where I, where to find them, etc. So this is the data which is generally available from about a general C++ audience, not a conference audience. And um, I have given an hour long talk about this last year, so I, I don't want to um, talk too much about statistics. I, I do want to mention I have my own survey too, which is uh, starting in 2020, so that's what we have data for. Um, it's a continuous survey, so it's not like an annual survey. It's uh, web-based and it's a tool which I've written myself to kind of you know have full control over the data and kind of be able to manipulate it. Um, and I do have a lot more questions. I have, for example, a question about library and language features, usage and standards from 11 to 20 currently, uh, which brings kind of interesting results. This is for the library features in C++17, for example. I have a question about attributes, which recently was interesting. Someone asked like, do we know anything about attributes? And I was like, hey, I made a question for that a while ago, because I was wondering, do people actually use attributes? And yes, they seem to use, but there's one attribute which seems nobody uses, which is carries dependency. And there's, Interestingly, recently came up that uh, maybe unlikely and likely are right now not the best idea to use because that often turns off your optimizer for that part of the code. And it might not do what you want and you might, uh, you know, uh, end up with code that is worse. That's, that's the reason development. There was a talk of, at Core C++ last week about that. Haven't seen that. Looking forward to seeing this. But so I've seen some people being concerned when I posted that that so many people seem to to use it. Um, so if you if you use these and you you use them to gain performance, of course you should measure that if if that's the case. Um, I have a question if you attended C++ con. If a question if you attended a C++ conference, I could also have that put in here. Um, but just thought this is more uh, relevant. So there's a lot of folks which are not at our conferences, which we still reach. Uh, naturally, they're not here, and there's a lot of folks which never have been but would like to go, and maybe the employer doesn't allow them, maybe they have, you know, kids and can't just go for a week to CPPCon, or other reasons not, not to go, but they would like to go. Maybe they can now join us with a, with a virtual conference, you know. Um, and there's, of course, a ton of people which were once and more. That's just how, how the distribution is. Um, I do want to mention that my own survey, unfortunately, is a bit biased. So if you're not from Europe, feel free to take my survey under survey.meetingcpu.com. Um, it's a long survey, and there is actually a CAPTCHA. If you want to get around the CAPTCHA, the, there is a, a shortcut. If you type in CPP cast with capital Cs, then uh, that should allow you to bypass the CAPTCHA, which otherwise is also easy to, uh, to uh, solve. Um, yeah, so this is... I think a reflection on my own reach. I, I post a lot of those uh, links for the polls on social media, and so lots of uh, lots of that traffic comes from social media, and hence is filtered through the lens of the algorithms which run on LinkedIn and Twitter and Facebook, which makes this probably more local. And as I run a European conference, I also have a lot of people which are more looking at my site for that reason um, in Europe. The golden age where we had growth and every year got better and was more exciting and it for conferences, but also for the committee. We, we just were not able to have on-site um, meetings anymore. And those on-site meetings, which we have are now restricted or not anyone wants to come, which I understand. So we will have to go through this time for a while. Um, 
my own experience in 2020 was not so great. It was very uncertain. Having a plan for multiple scenarios was necessary from the start. I followed the pandemic from the start because I knew that it would be really hugely important to know everything about it. Um, and unfortunately, it was very, very quickly clear that I could uh, only be in one room. We could only host one track and we would only be able to put like 150 folks, I think it was, or maybe 200 folks in that room. And that, that was at maximum capacity. And um, on the other hand, this was out of vaccination, this was without any, um, you know, things picking up again and forth. With, with the pandemic, we really had trouble selling those tickets. Um, so the lockdown in November in Germany is in 2020 would kind of save me. End of October, I get a call from the hotel and they're like, well, unfortunately, we cannot host your event because we decided to lock down the whole hotel. We are closing the hotel as long as the lockdown is valid because uh, it's not it's not uh, worth every, every, everyone to, to host the hotel anymore. I have been in the hotel in 2020 in October and it was a ghost town. It was a scathing experience to enter an empty hotel lobby which was barely lit and you wondered if anybody is there. Um, so I I'm very glad that this happened and kind of saved my organization. Um, but, you know, there also has been positive things, you know. Um, I started a user group, which is only online, and which experiments with different formats, not just talks, because talks is a, it's a default content and everyone gives talks or not. But I wanted to try other things. Um, and today we have our 50th meeting finished and uh, the next two are the job fairs for next week, which we uh, have scheduled. And then there will be an AMA with uh, Nico Yosotis in uh, October, which is not yet announced. Um, and so if you want to join it, I want to invite you to join that, actually. Um, you can reach the, the user group over uh, the URL on the slide. Um, one important part that is a success with this group is that we established a C++ job fair and the book and tool fair. So we have two uh, new ways of sharing the audience with folks that have an interest in that and kind of offer content which is in parallel with a book and tool fair that we can go from table to table and either talk to an employer or in the book and tool fair talk to tool vendors, see their demos or I talk to book authors, which has been of a very good success. Um, when we did the first book and tool for actually Bjarne came, that, that was a very, very popular table at that evening. Um, we've tried finally lightning talks in an online setting that works too. Um, and uh, something which uh, I did from the beginning for the conference now is also part of the user group. Um, we're having Ask Me Anything for C++ AMAs. Um, in the user group. And I hope to, you know, kind of, I, I cannot replace CPP cast and I do not want to replace it, but I, I hope to offer one more step stone that offers a position where people can talk about what they do with C++. Um, which brings me quickly to comment on the current situation with hybrid events. CPPCon was hybrid last year and this, this year. Um, we start to be hybrid this year. I expect conferences to be hybrid also in the next year. I think SCU uh, was hybrid this year. Other conferences also were hybrid. Can't like name them all, you know. Um, CPP on C was hybrid. They choose to, to do the conference first and then do the online conference after that. So technically they were not hybrid, but depends on your definition, right? So. For my conference this year, I, I want to use a lot of pre-recordings because that's getting us out of the technical issues uh, with a speaker um, at the beginning of the talk, which happened last year. Even if we checked and not every speaker has the time and it's really time intensive to prepare those online conferences. Um, and we, of course, also have a live stream and uh, probably also will host some online talks live. 
um, of course. But the whole thing is a challenge to organize. You need to make sure that there is a stable internet connection. That there is a huge extra effort. I spend like three hours in meetings to speak online at this conference and some additional time to fill out forms and register here, register there, and uh, make sure like you know that everything is set up in the way that we can do this in a successful way. And so there's a really big overhead and also an overhead in cost. And I can tell you that I have not, I have yet to meet the sponsor which is excited about being online. So sponsorships are mostly about being on site and talking to real people, unfortunately. So getting funding for all this is really difficult. And I hope that we kind of can get the, the attention of the community, which of course, you know, it's, it's kind of hard to compete with free when you release the videos uh, onto YouTube later, right? That's also not the audience we, we, we want here to, to, to pay. That's, it's okay that those videos are free and they should be free. They, I don't want to have that uh, we start our own little empires of um, video content that is behind paywalls. That would be a bad idea. Um, so I expect that hybrid conferences probably in the future will become more lean, especially if they're not as big as CppCon. Which brings me to the other issue for the on-site conferences. We're not as big anymore. We don't have as much funding. Uh, basically, it's the minimal viable conference which we organize in those times, which also is kind of difficult when you're used to the, the, the big event, which also your contract is about, right, uh, for the conference. So I'm, I'm very happy that this was a good experience in downsizing my conference this year. And that I am not like still signed up for like organizing a huge conference and know, knowing that like every other conference in this year has been around one third of the attendance in 2019. Um, so kind of we see that a new cycle begins. This is actually a thought which I had in when I thought about the 10 years for the first time in January this year and blocked about it when. C++ now came around again this year, because um, it was a 10 year anniversary of, 10, of C++ now, and I remembered all those things. Um, would have loved to be in, in Aspen, but for me personally, I don't travel to the US right now due to the pandemic. Um, but I kind of, you know, if you, if you think about it, it makes sense. Um, C++ 20 is a new, C++ 11, it's, it's a new base standard for a lot of this decade probably. Um, and implementations have to catch up first again. Um, there are lots of new things and an unknown practice for like what is the best practice and how, how does it work to like implement your own modules for an open source project? Um, which is an interesting question. And I talked to that about um, with Daniela Engert, uh, which has been active in format and now is the lead and the developer which brings format to the world of modules. And that is quite interesting. And she told me that like, yeah, so the, 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 the easiest things we figured out, but the, the details when we implement things and the, the bugs and the tool chains, that's still something which, you know, she had a lot of uh, feedback for both or all the vendors that which are implementing this. Uh, and she gives those vendors really, really important feedback because all those implementations kind of have some bugs to, to iron out before that is like really prime time ready. So thank you for that work, Daniela, by the way. Um, and then if we continue with this logic, 23 is 14. That's, that's how it is, right? That's how it feels. I guess you're not surprised that I tell you that the 26 will be the 17th of this decade. Um, while I have the hope that, you know, um, this isn't so much 17 as it is more of seven, like more standard things in there. Uh, I think, um, that we have basically three years to make that happen. And we're still partly in the pandemic. So we're probably really good if C26 is a new 17. 
the decret. Um, so let's talk about the shared future from us all in C++. I do want to address two of the issues, which in my opinion are the most fundamental. There is a big, great, and vitally important work ongoing in bringing the SD execution effort, which encumbers so much like scheduling, parallelism, concurrency, coroutines, and there's probably something missing on this list, right? Um, the executor's proposal is so hugely important because that's how we will run C++ in context. We, for the, for the first time, we actually try to do this. And then we have, we, we seem to have, I don't want to say a problem with RB, but I think that we should definitely take a look at RB. That's, that's the other big issue. Let me start with enabling asynchronous operations in C++. Eric Niebler has given a great talk about that in at last year's CppCon, and I suppose we also have this year talks about executors, which is more current than last year's version. Um, and I, I do want to point out, it's just a placeholder of the talk, but it's a great talk and I've seen it last year and I, this is an introduction into Shady Rose and they probably changed change some things, but if, you, if you're interested in it, it's, it's a great talk to see. Um, and I think it's the most fundamental building block which we have for C++, which we're building right now. Everything else will build on top of this in the future. And that's also why we need to take care about that this is getting done right. Um, any error, any oversight will carry heavy. Um, and taking this time to get this right is the right approach. So I hope that with 26, we will see the first fruits of that in the standard. But I also know that the committee does not promise anything anymore, which is also the right approach. Yeah, it's, you know, don't quote me on that in, in 26. Uh, it's also not that anyone uh, from, from this proposal has said anything in this direction. I heard anything on that. And unfortunately, of course, this blocks the progress for others, like, you know, networking would be also great. Um, but at the moment, that's, that's how it is. And that is the most pressing issue which we need to solve in the standardization. Um, I do want to mention that there is a reference implementation, which I've found out currently is living in the uh, GitHub from Bryce Lerbach. But I've also heard that they are planning to move this into a repo at NVIDIA, if I heard that correct. Maybe it will be repo somewhere else, but they plan to move it in a, in a, in a you know, somewhere else. That, that is the plan. And this is um, the current proposal for the SSP 2300, um, which I don't know if that's going to change or that's going to be the, the final proposal for that. It's, I'm not up to date on that. But I think it's like a hugely uh, important effort. Um, and if you want to use executors today, there's libunifex, which is a reference, not a reference implementation. Um, it was the original implementation where we started playing around with those ideas by Eric Niebler and others. And um, this is basically the executors and scheduler library, which is production ready at the moment. Um, which is having the goal to follow the standard and adopt to what the standard will adopt to. Okay. I found also another library which seems to implement the standard partially or fully. I don't know so much. Um, but it doesn't have had changes in one year. Um, but I want to say that this library has a really good documentation, which you might want to check out. Um, URL is on the screen. I found this when I looked for C++ 23 executors uh, because I wanted to make sure that there really isn't anything from 23 in executors or if I would find this is search from anything, I would be uh, worse for the talk and I did. So, great. 
Um, and I'm under the impression that this implementation might have been written for a presentation. Um, this stops kind of in the time of the summer last year uh, when uh, it would, had like things added to it. And so it's probably someone trying to implement the current proposal because it's actually a speaker from, from other conferences in my conference last year too, which is a lead author of this. Um, which brings me to ABI, the application binary interface. Um, for a long time, there have been two camps in C++. One camp cares about it and the other one is happy to break it. And they you know, exist on the same planet, but it's two different worlds. So let me start with saying clearly that to break RB or not is not the question. Okay. Um, I do think that C++ needs to respect its users. So the wise thing to understand about that is that both sides are right. There are good arguments for backing RV and there's a ton of people which probably would like to do that, but can't. And they have the other arguments, which is well, it's just not upon us to, to break that. We can. Um, which makes this really difficult because there is no side to pick. They're both right. And it's kind of a Gordian knot. So we, we need to find some compromise. And otherwise, this never will get solved and we'll, we'll stay an issue, which it should not be. We should, we should offer uh, like both ways, not like just say we are breaking our with an extender, which some people try it and they failed because there's a lot of people who say, no, no, that's not happening. And understandably, they're saying that it's not happening. And I would not be talking about this when I wouldn't have watched the keynote from Bryce Adelstein Lelbach at C++ Now in the last year, where he spoke about what belongs in the standard library. And surprisingly, he talked also about ABI. He presented various ways to deal with ABI breakage or stability. Um, you really should look that. Uh, you really should look up this keynote. By the way, it's, I, I'm not like quoting it fully because it's a 90 minute keynote. But uh, the one thing which got my attention was this slide, where we would have a language edition which allows us to pin down um, an interface to a certain um, standard, maybe to a certain version of a standard or to, a, I, I would love to have this as like, you know, to, to have it as a user defined thing available that we can pin our code to a standard, which would be great, but also pin a library to its version and say this 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 library version, and now we can move on with the next library version, and this is the changes we have. Um, according to Bryce from last year, this would solve all the problems Bryce thought about as for regards for the library, for the standard library, for others probably too. Um, but I am not sure so much about uh, if that's like really true or not. That's something to see. Um, this is a proposal, by the way. I've tried to figure out where it went to the committee. It did have a life at the committee. Um, there is no new revision since the 2020 revision. It's, I think, a really interesting idea, which we should try to evolve forward and really invest into. But I also understand that 23 was more important to get out of the door. So it's probably suffering from that and also suffering from executors needing to get out the door first. Um, so that is a proposal worth watching. And I, I really want to say, you know, uh, this is probably a long time thing. That's not going to make it in 26 if we can't do it. If we can do it, of course, great. But this is more like, something again, like the, the executors, which we have to carefully design in the right way, but it's an interesting opinion. And I'd like to see it throughout the community debated and brought forward and um, to have this um, 
become either an alternative or well known why it's not an alternative and why it's not in the standard. I think that is uh, not only necessary to add new features to the standard, which are library based, but also like we should see if we can like, enable something in the language like that. That would be really important. Um, and yeah, this proposal would allow us to kind of have a compromise and it's an R0, which is not like the finished, the finished version, which goes into a standard usually. So this would have to, you know, be really, uh, be still spend its time in the committee. And then we would, from that point of view, see what, what really gets out of this. And if this is something the, the committee is willing to do with C++, I hope they are, it would be really important to, to make an effort to solve the situation. And then, of course, there's all the other things, you know, pattern matching, reflection, networking, just to name a few things. And we should not forget that all the things we add to the standard need to take up some maintenance and need to be you know, updated to new standards. Maybe you want to add uh, a way to have, you know, coroutines with that, etc. There's a lot of effort going into the standard in this decade. And we will need people to be motivated to do that and maintainers to not only to step up the game, we will need new maintainers to do all of this. Because um, C++ is always short of maintainers, I think. Um, so shout out to the maintainers. Thank you for actually, you know, implementing the language and making it possible that we are able to enjoy the new updates. Which, last but not least, let me say that C++ is more than just the standard. I personally, for a long time, lived a life as a freelancer, and I was free, and I had little care for the standards of that decade. It was C++ or free. But usually it was what my customer wanted, right? What's available? I can't come in as a freelancer and say, well, we are, I'm writing C11 for you. You need to update your whole compiler base. That's not fine with you then. Um, and so we are a huge, hugely diverse community and we are just reaching into this. We're just at the beginning still again of uh, this decade. Um, and so just a few examples shout out to some libraries. Uh, some of the awesome web tools which have come uh, with us in, in the golden age was called Bolt, and there's a ton of others. Uh, there is a modern C++ block from Reiner, there's Boost, Qt. Um, you probably wonder what the what the frog is. That is a frog from the tree frog frame, uh, framework, which exists also for, I think, 10 years or more, uh, which is a Japanese uh, project for having uh, website based in C++. Um, there's also some, some other projects for this. Um, and the ostrich is for, um, not for build bench, that's a beaver, um, the beaver. It's quick bench. 